VIU Online presents GEC 101 English Composition, Week 1, Practical Lecture B, Expectations for College Writing and Critical Thinking and Argument. This lecture is presented by Dr. Laura Hills, Professor of English at Virginia International University. The academic writing you will do for this course will be more formal than the writing you do for social media. But what does that mean practically? Let's consider for a moment a message that you might put together into a tweet for Twitter. Yikes! Taken GEC 101 from VIU Online. No more time for nothing else. We'll be buried in work, goodbye world, smiley face, LOL. Notice here we have fragments. We have a word that doesn't even exist in English, nothing, rather than nothing, misspelling there. We have taken instead of taking, very informal. And yet, this does convey the feeling extremely well. But now, let's consider how you would rework the same sentiment for a more formal or academic audience. GEC from VIU, GEC 101 from VIU Online will be a challenging course for me this term. A review of the course syllabus suggests that the workload will be steep. That means that I will be devoting a great deal of, of my free time to completing the required readings and course assignments. My family and friends are supportive of my education, but I suspect that they will miss my company in the weeks ahead. Nonetheless, I am ready to face the challenge before me. Well, certainly this is a lot longer, and it is a well-structured paragraph, of course. So you can see that when we write for a formal audience, it's more than just using full sentences and words. It is a fully developed idea without any abbreviating it. Here's a tip. Formal does not equal stodgy and boring. It's okay to entertain your reader even when writing for an academic audience. One of the most surprising aspects of my own doctoral dissertation is that it began with a story from my own life. And that was perhaps a little bit of an unusual way to begin an academic work such as a doctoral dissertation, but it immediately captured attention and showed my own connection to my topic. So even in the most formal writing, you can find ways to engage and entertain your reader. Another challenge you'll be facing this term is that you'll be learning to create new knowledge based upon your own thinking and on what others have said. But what does that mean practically? Well, imagine for a moment that you're writing a report. A report might have a line such as this one. Cell phones enable us to communicate with one another with same-time conversations, voicemail, and text messaging. Now let's compare that kind of writing with one in which you have to engage more with your topic and do more of your own analysis and work toward that argument that we have been talking about this week. Here's new knowledge. Though cell phones have made most of us more accessible to one another, they have also impacted our relationships in negative ways. Now that is an argument. The first is a report. The second new knowledge is staking, taking a stand that now would have to be defended with research. We are also focusing this week on making our writing easier for our readers to consume. But what does that mean practically? Well, you remember we talked about cooking food. And I showed spaghetti and meatballs in our theoretical lecture. Well, imagine that you're going to serve a turkey. Now, here's a live turkey. This would not be the way that you would serve such a dish. So this is hard to consume. I like chocolate. Cats, lions, potatoes, pianos, spaghetti and meatballs, alligators, trumpets, carrots, canaries, pizza, hamburgers, giraffes, olives, 
parrots, chickpeas, seals, violins, ice cream, turtles, trombones, elephants, lizards, cookies, guitars, frogs, onions, and harps. Well, aside from being a very long sentence, if I asked you now to close your eyes, how many of those could you remember? It's very hard, right? Let's look at how you could cook the dish. As we cooked spaghetti in our other lecture, we're cooking the turkey this time, so he's easy to consume. I like things in three categories, animals, food, and musical instruments. The animals I like are cats, lions, alligators, canaries, giraffes, parrots, seals, turtles, elephants, lizards, and frogs. The foods I like are chocolate, potatoes, spaghetti, and meatballs, etc. You see what I've done? I've given the reader a way to categorize, to hang on to the information, a way to have a framework now, if I asked you to close your eyes, probably you wouldn't remember too many of the specifics, but you might remember that I like things in three categories, animals, food, and musical instruments. And that might be the most important thing for the reader to remember. So rather than giving a litany of information, helping your reader create and keep a framework is part of what makes academic writing so strong. Here's a tip. When writing your research paper, think of yourself as a tour guide to your topic. Guide the reader in a helpful and engaging way. Now, if you were giving me a tour of your community, you would tell me things about it and help me see the sights. You'd say, look to the left, look to the right, be careful crossing this street. Don't assume things that aren't true. Let me tell you the real story. Well, it's no different in a research paper. You're going to help your reader by saying, I want you to look over here. I want you to think about this. And I want you not to make these mistakes. Anticipate the questions they're likely to ask. Ask them and answer them. So that you are serving as a knowledgeable guide. We are also urged to become engaged readers and to read actively by interacting with the text. But what does that mean practically? Well, here are a, uh, here's a whole long list of things to do before you read and as you read. Let's take a look at them. On the left side, before you read, you identify the purpose of your reading. You formulate pre-reading questions. You survey the text, which means you look through it before you read it. You connect your prior knowledge of the topic. You pose questions to answer as you read. So even before you begin, you started to do some engagement. And then as you read, you read with a pen in hand so you can jot down notes and questions. You can ask and answer questions. What's not clear to you? You can read aloud sentences and portions of text that you find challenging. You can look for signposts as you read the text. Signposts would be things like the first example or the most important point so that it's telling you how things stand out. Or as you'll see in the following example, that's a signpost. It's telling you the connection between what you just read and what's about to come. And you can challenge the text. Do you agree with it? Do you disagree with it? And why? Here's a tip. After you read, take time to digest and savor what you've just consumed so that you don't rush on to the next activity. Think about it before turning to that next activity and let the ideas gel. Mull them over. You'll get more out of your reading that way. Another tip, stop reading when you don't know what the text means. Now, I know this sounds extremely simplistic, but working with college students, I can tell you that one of the great things you will learn in university life is to be a good learner. And a good learner separates what he or she knows from what he or she doesn't know. And in an effort to get the work done, many students rush through the text even when they're not fully getting what the messages are. So separate what you know from what you don't know. And remember that points of confusion can help you engage with the text. If you already knew everything in the text, there'd really be no reason to read it. If the text isn't challenging you at some points, then it probably isn't pushing you at the right level. 
as a professor, we want you to reach those points of confusion to stop, to separate what you know from what you don't know, perhaps to go back. And this is where the golden questions come from. So slow down and realize when you don't know what's going on. That's a great opportunity for learning. We learned if the writer doesn't suffer, the reader will. But what does that mean practically? Well, good writers continue to improve the text again and again until it is just right. I can't even tell you how many times I go over what I have written before I send it to a publisher. Zillions. There is no number I can put to it. Proofread the final text carefully before sharing it. And this point, the third bullet point, is an important one. Are you willing to kill your babies? That's an expression writers sometimes use. That means that they are willing to cut passages of text that took a lot of time and effort to create or that they particularly like because doing so will improve the finished work. That is a tough thing to do when you have labored over something and then realize the paper would be better without it. In that case, you've got to take it out, even though that's painful. Here's a tip. Most writers tire of their own writing. When you're reading and editing so much that you're getting sick of what you're, you've written, you're on the right track. Now, I've written and published five books and hundreds of articles. And I can tell you there hasn't been anything I've ever written that I didn't get tired of before it was all over. And that's because I polish, polish, polish. Good academic writers also narrow their topics. But what does that mean practically? Let's look at broad and narrow topics. On the left, the broad topic is whales. And on the right, the narrow topic is sleep habits of sperm whales in the Mediterranean Sea. The left, Shakespeare. The right, Cordelia's devotion in Shakespeare's King Lear. 3D printing becomes using 3D printing for rapid prototyping in industry. And the broad topic of Mozart becomes Masonic elements in Mozart's magic flute. This is where you need to do some work before beginning to write, narrowing the topic. Wales is too broad for a research paper. We have to get as narrow as possible so that we can fully argue the point and support it with research. As a peer reviewer, you're supposed to comment on the ideas being presented and the organization of the writing. You're to focus on the big picture, but what does that mean practically? Well, here's a little picture. You misspelled the word catastrophe in the second paragraph. Now that kind of remark is helpful if you want to correct spelling, but it does not make a person become a better writer. Now let's look at big picture peer review comment. You might add a paragraph or two at the beginning of your paper to explain your own experience with the topic. That would make your paper more personal and engaging for the reader. I know I'd find it more interesting if you did that. Then perhaps you can relate each part of your paper to your experience, helping us to see how you have dealt with the challenge personally. Here we're talking about the very structure of the paper in the larger sense. As a peer reviewer, remember, you're there to help with big picture thinking. The little minuscule how you misspelled a word or forgot a comma is only marginally helpful. It is not going to help the person grow as a writer, only as an editor. What you want to give is the kind of substantive comments that will help a person think in broad sense about how to improve his or her writing. A tip, when crafting an argument, consider whether to construct or deconstruct it for your reader. Now, what does this mean? Let's look at how you would construct an argument. Most people who are in the market for a new pet want one that will be loyal to them. They will also want a pet that can be trained easily and that can interact intelligently with them. Finally, most people will appreciate a pet that can be a good companion and with whom they, have a lot in, uh, they will have a lot of fun. For these reasons, 
Dogs are the best choice for anyone who is looking for a new pet. You see what we did? We made three points and the conclusion, we constructed the argument and concluded with dogs are the best pet. Now let's deconstruct the same argument. Dogs are the best pet for anyone who is in the market for a new pet for three reasons. First, dogs are extremely loyal to their owners. Second, dogs are smarter than most other pets. They are relatively easy to train and are capable of interacting intelligently with their owners. Finally, dogs are wonderful companions that can be a lot of fun to play with. Do you see the difference? Here we started with the punchline, dogs are the best pet. And then we explain how we reached that conclusion. This is a basic decision for you as an author. Are you going to construct or deconstruct your argument? You can go either way. You have to think about what's going to be most effective given your purpose and your reader for the paper. We are also encouraged to reflect on our own writing and learning before moving on to other projects. But what does that mean practically? Here's a list of things that you can do when thinking critically about your writing. These are questions. What did I learn about this topic by writing about it? What do I see as a weakness of my writing? What am I most worried about? What would I change about the process of exploring, planning, and drafting my paper? How did awareness of my audience help me shape my writing? Would I change anything about the research I did? What is the strength of my writing? What is my favorite part and why? These are excellent questions to ask at the conclusion of a writing assignment. After your instructor has given you feedback and even a grade, these are very good questions to ask. This will help you grow and improve as a writer because you can apply lessons learned from that experience to your next piece of writing. We are further encouraged to back up our ideas with specifics. But what does that mean practically? Well, here we have an unsupported idea. Dogs are the best pet. And I've given you an image of the Leaning Tower of Pisa, which we hope remains a long time, but has a questionable stability. Here's a much more stable structure, the Empire State Building in New York City, and a supported idea. Dogs are the best pet for three reasons. They are loyal, they are intelligent, and they are great companions. You see the difference. Any claim you make in a research paper must be supported. We are also considering Aristotle's idea that arguments should appeal to ethos, pathos, and or logos. But what does that mean practically? Well, if we're looking at ethos, we're, con we're looking at ethics and convincing someone of the character and credibility of the persuader. So an example would be, doctors all over the world recommend this type of treatment. So this says this is a good thing because many people of good character recommend it. A pathos argument creates an emotional response. Your good health is in jeopardy and you may die prematurely if you do not follow this type of treatment. Yes, this is a scare tactic, but that is an emotional response. And finally, logos, an appeal to logic. The research is perfectly clear. 99.4% of patients who follow this type of treatment are cured. Now you can combine these into a research paper, but you see how they're very different types of argument, ethos, pathos, and logos. Be aware of this as you craft your own arguments. What do you think is going to be most effective for your reader to be persuaded that you are correct? A tip. As you work on your skills to craft arguments, you'll become more aware of the arguments that you're exposed to every day. And that is a good thing. We are bombarded with all kinds of arguments. And here, look at this, buy, buy, buy. All advertising is an argument. So as you become better at writing arguments, you're also going to become a more savvy consumer of arguments, and that will make you better at figuring out what is sensible for you to do and not do, rather than falling prey to the kinds of tactics we see in advertising. 
This concludes Practical Lecture B for Week 1.